what caused the crisis? I think if we were to go back to a few months ago, there would be fairly wide agreement about what the problem was. And the agreement would be that it was some problems in the mortgage industry. And so what had happened was that the way the mortgage industry worked had changed significantly over the, the last few years. So traditionally, banks would raise funds, they would screen borrowers, and then they would lend out money. If the borrowers defaulted, they would bear the loss, and that created good incentives. Now, over time, that process changed for a number of reasons. But one of the things that happened as it changed was that incentives changed. So instead of banks originating mortgages and holding on to them, what happened was that brokers and also some banks started originating them, and then they would sell them to be securitized. And what that did was to change the incentives because the originators, the brokers and the banks, got paid on the number of mortgages that they originated. And so their incentive was to have as many mortgages as possible. And because they were selling them off, it wasn't their problem if they defaulted. Now, the second stage in the process of this new mortgage system was to have securitization. So what happened is that the people like SIVs or investment banks or whoever was going to do the securitization, they would pool a whole set of mortgage together and they would take them from across the country so they would have good risk properties and things like that and a whole set of different characteristics. And they would then tranche them so that the risk was spread differentially depending on which tranche you have. So the buyers of the junior tranches would get the losses allocated to them first. And then as you go up towards the more senior ones, you'd have to have a lot of losses before you would get to your tranche. So those senior tranches were rated AAA. They were regarded as fairly risk-free. And then as we went down, the most junior tranches would have lower and lower ratings. If you want to know how much are your stocks worth, it's a very difficult decision. It wouldn't be surprising if the stock market went up 50%. It also wouldn't be surprising if it went down 50% in the next few weeks. So both of those are possible. So there's, there's huge uncertainty about that. If you look at commodities, if you think about the price volatility on commodities, it's just enormous. It was only last summer the oil was trading at $147 a barrel. Now it's around 40 to 50, it's gone even lower. If you're gonna buy a car, should you buy a Toyota Prius, which is gonna be fuel efficient, but cost two or $3,000 more, or should you buy an SUV on the assumption that gas prices are gonna be low? It's very difficult to make that decision. If you're a firm, it's very difficult. Look at exchange rates. Exchange rates have been incredibly volatile. If you look back last summer, the pound was over two, $2 to the pound. Now it's 140, 145. The euro was 160 last summer. It's now down to about 130. It's been even lower. If you're trying to make decisions about anything, it's very difficult because you don't know where they're going to be a month from now, let alone a year from now. And that's, in my view, what's chilling the global economy. You don't know how to make decisions because you don't know what the prices are. And that's the big issue. That's true for consumers, it's true for firms. And that's why investment goods are not being bought, that's why exports are plummeting, and that's the real problem. It's this uncertainty. So to summarize, there's two basic problems, I would say. One is we don't really know what prices should be guiding economic decisions, and that's a big problem. And the second problem is the financial system has these enormous problems because of this meltdown in prices, and the two interact, and, and that's where we're at. 
Now, one question which is important is, why has the financial system done so poorly? After all, this is the most regulated sector in pretty much all economies. We've had you know, the Fed in the US, the OCC, the SEC, many, many regulatory bodies, they're supposed to be regulating what's going on. What happened? Why did things get so out of control? Why did this come as such a surprise to so many people? I think the first thing is to realize that banking regulation is very different from other kinds of regulation that we have. In the US, we're having these very large drop in, uh, in workforce. So that this is what the companies are doing. They're going out, they're cutting, they're cutting their workforces. If you look on the other side, dividends outside of financial services and a few other firms, dividends are actually going up still. So they're following that. If you take Germany at the other extreme, Germany, is not cutting very much. In fact, Volkswagen is increasing employment and a number of other ones. Now, what that means is that in Germany, people are not worried by unemployment because they don't feel personally threatened. So that, first of all, has the, the beneficial effect that it's not going to affect it directly by having all these unemployed people. But perhaps more important, the fear of unemployment is much, much less. Okay, and if you look at the aggregate statistics of what's happening, what you see is that the US is going up dramatically. You know, we're going from 6% up to 8.5%, no, no um, stoppage in sight. But you know, Germany here is basically very flat. They've hoarded workers and they're cutting dividends. The workers therefore don't feel threatened, they're still consuming. If you think back to G20 last week, one of the big issues was the US and the UK are saying, look, we need to have these stimulus packages. France and Germany are saying, no, we don't need that. Well, one of the big differences is it doesn't affect people in France and Germany nearly as much because they have very different kinds of corporate governance. Japan is an interesting case because they've always had this great commitment to full employment. If Citigroup was to fail, you would see this tremendous wave of failures probably around the world. And this would cause a meltdown in the financial system, which would greatly exacerbate all the problems. Now, having said that, though, too big to fail doesn't mean that you do what we currently did for these large institutions. We basically went in, gave them a blank check, and let them do what they want. Now, I would say that that's a very bad precedent. Because in the future, what's going to happen is people are going to try and get to be big again. They know they're then too big to fail, and everything's going to be fine for most of the employees. If you form a business relationship with them, you know you're going to be able to continue. So I would argue what we should do is have too big to fail, but those institutions, we should go in and start liquidating them in an orderly manner. That would allow the other institutions that didn't fail, that are well run, to expand and take the business. This idea of propping up the weak ones that did badly is just not a good long-term idea. We don't want to let them fail in a disorderly manner because contagion is a huge problem. But we probably should remove them so the well banned banks like JP Morgan and HSBC are the ones that are allowed to expand and profit from the situation. You know, in, in the auto industry, the equivalent is Ford is there. Ford did a great job. They avoided going bankrupt. Now the government is stopping them benefit because they're, they're bailing out General Motors, at least. We need to have bankruptcy rules that allow the equivalent of prompt corrective action for banks. So with a bank, you can step in before it goes bankrupt and essentially take government control 
You don't have to have a vote of the shareholders. You can do that before that happens. We need to have that for all the financial institutions. That's what they should have been able to do with Bear Stearns and with Lehman, and we wouldn't have had this great uncertainty. Let me give you uh, one other, which is a much more controversial one. I would argue we need to have a public sector commercial bank because in times of crisis, you're going to need something in the state to take over. At the moment, that's what the Fed is doing. They've become the, arguably one of the biggest, commercial, if not the biggest commercial bank in the world. But the people in the Fed don't know how to run a commercial bank. They don't know much about credit risk. They're mostly macroeconomists who are interested in real real uh, business cycles and things. So I think we need to have expertise in the public sector which allows them to run commercial banks in a sensible way. I think we also need to have international coordination to prevent the kind of thing that happened with uh, AIG where they, they basically exploited regulatory arbitrage. And that's, that's going to be quite difficult to get.